And as that song said, you know, we are the clay and you are the potter and you've molded us and shaped us into your image. So Lord, make us that tapestry. Make us that vessel used for an instrument of purpose and an instrument of righteousness. So we love you and praise you for all that you're doing. And Lord, we, we are so excited to read the word this, this evening and to learn your word. We never, it never gets old, it never gets tired, it's always fresh. It's fresh manna, it's fresh bread. And it's food for our spirit and our soul. And you nourish us and you fill us quite well. And we love you and praise you. And all God's people said, amen. in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good evening, everyone. We are in Judges chapter 3. Cruising along. Uh, anybody here need a Bible? If you need one, raise your hand. We'll get you one. You can follow along. We're only going to deviate from Judges once that I know of so far. <laughs> But, of course, I'm on a need-to-know basis, and if I don't need to know, then I don't get told. So, <clears throat> Judges chapter 3. So last week, we looked, <clears throat> as we went through Judges chapter 1 and 2, uh, we saw like a, a prelude to what Judges was going to be about. Uh, they, they conquered the lands. Joshua died. Uh, all those that were in leadership uh, died as well. A new generation had come and that uh, didn't see the things that God did. They were too young to see it, uh, but now they've grown up. Uh, we revisited the story about Caleb and, and a guy named Othniel that we're going to see him again tonight. Uh, Caleb needed a land uh, um, I needed somebody to go into the land to take over it, and Othniel volunteered, and his uh, rainbow at the end of the tunnel was his daughter named uh, Asha, uh, which means adorned. So we saw that, and he, he ended up getting that, and then two springs of water, the upper and the lower springs, and uh, so they began, we saw that that was a picture of the church and Jesus Christ. Um, so, as we went through that, we saw warnings, we saw how they didn't completely destroy the enemy, didn't completely wipe them out, they were being disobedient, and really that's where we left them off, left off with them was last week. So as we pick up today, uh, in chapter 3 and verse 1, it says this, now these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. So they didn't know. They didn't have that experience of seeing what God did because it's a, this is a new generation. Uh, one generation had passed already, and uh, now this generation hasn't seen the things that God did. Now, it's interesting here because when I read this and I see that he might test Israel or that he might prove them. Now, it's, God does that with us, too, as things come about in our lives, and, and God allows them to happen to test or prove us, not that we're there to pass a test and we have to meet the qualifications, but it's this, so that we know really who we are, because God already knows. But when we know, hey, you know what, I'm full of pride, well, God wants us to know that. So he'll allow us to get into some situations to show us that, hey, you know, we're pretty prideful. It's something that we need to pray about and we need to take care of. And this is what he's saying. So he, what he's doing here is he's, he's saying there were certain areas and there were pockets of people here and there, and there was also a bigger picture of that some of the tribes did not totally eliminate uh, the enemy, and we're going to see it's going to come back to bite them. But he's saying, look, <clears throat> these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test or prove to them uh, what's really in their heart. And verse 2 says, this was the 
This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formally known it. So they've had a peace for a period of time. But the thing that they didn't know, that their, maybe their parents might not have told them, is that it was God that fought for them, wasn't it? It wasn't anything they did. What did they do at Jericho? They walked around 13 times over a seven-day period, right? right? And what happened? The walls fell down. Yeah, how does that work? So let's walk around this building 13 times over seven days, and do you think the building would fall down? No. Only well, that's true. So they really didn't do anything to fight this nation to fight uh, at Jericho, did they? They tried to go at it on their own at Ai, and what happened? They lost. They They didn't pray. They didn't ask the Lord. The Lord didn't go before them, and they lost. But when they cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, help us, what do we do? He said, go, I'll give them into your hands. I have already given them into your hands. It's already been done. You just got to walk through it. It's like our salvation. We come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, knowing the fact that by him and him alone, the shed blood on the cross, that we can be saved. And all we have to do is believe that free gift, right? Right. What did we do? Nothing. Well, wait a minute. You know, I went to church every Sunday and Wednesday. I went to the men's group. And, and you know, if the church was open, I was there, even if it was to play basketball or something. But I was there. Isn't that good enough? No, sorry, it isn't. Well, I was in the mission field. Isn't that good enough? No. Only by one thing you can be saved, by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. There's nothing else you can do. He's already done it. He was on the cross. What did he say? It is finished. It's complete. Your salvation is complete. Now it starts this whole other thing. Now the Lord molds us and makes us into the image of his son. And, and sometimes, you know, like the clay that gets moved and pushed around, uh, and it, like uh, Scott said, you know, we're a masterpiece. We're God's masterpiece. And, but sometimes it, you know, kind of hurts. You know, it's like getting a, uh, you know, a massage. You know, sometimes it hurts. They're grinding on you and grinding on you, and you're like, oh, man, what did I sign up for this for? Not only that, but I'm paying them to do it. This doesn't make any sense. But after, oh, man, that feels pretty good. It's kind of like walking through Christianity, isn't it? You know, you, the Lord leads, you walk through. Sometimes there's trials. Sometimes there's tribulation. Not sometimes. They're going to happen. We're going to have them. James said, not if you have trials, but when you have trials. You're going to get them. So here's this new generation. They didn't know the wars. They didn't know what God did for them. And it's really kind of sad because weren't their parents teaching them that, telling them the stories So verse 3 says, namely, five lords of the Philistines, all of the Canaanites, the Sidonites, the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test or prove Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the Termites were probably there too. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. So these nations were left. They didn't utterly destroy them like God told them to do. And not only that, but what? They did not obey the commandments of the Lord. So they did what? They dwelt among the Canaanites and all these other nations 
They dwelt among them. They lived with them. God told them to destroy them. And then because they dwelt with them, what happened? They took their daughters to be their wives, and they gave their daughters to be their sons, and they served their gods. Exactly what God told them would happen if they did it, if they didn't eliminate them completely. Now turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. So this is the book that we went, there are two books uh, to the left. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse, we're going to pick up in verse 1. And it says this, when, not if, but when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. Who's doing the work? God, and God is going to do it, right? He's doing it for this nation. And he says, when, when I do this, and when I bring you into the land, that for you to possess, everything is set up. Remember, God said it was a land of milk and honey. And it was. Everything was there. The fields were there. The fruits were there. The vegetables were there. The wheat was there. The farming land was there. God had prepared all of this for them so that they could walk into the promised land. And when they got there, you remember what happened? What happened with their food supply? What, what were they eating before? Manna. manna. Remember they were eating manna. God every day would, would, it would give them manna every day. As soon as they got there and they got into the promised land, it stopped because God had filled the whole land in front of them with food. So everything was there before them. But he said, when you go in there to possess it, cast out these nations. You don't want to have anything to do with them. If you remember uh, when, when God was talking to Abraham, and he says that, that, that his, their descendants would inherit the land. When? After the fullness of the Gentiles. So God had put all this in place, all this farmland, all these fruits and vegetables. You remember the grapes. You remember how many people did it take to carry back one grape cluster? Two, Two people. That had to be, you remember those uh, grapefruits we had here last week, and then they were here Sunday. Somebody brought in some grapefruits for us. They were huge. They were, you know, like this big. That's probably how big those grapes were. The two people. Two men to carry him. That's pretty big. So God had prepared this all before them. But they had to do their part, didn't they? And their part was what? Their part was obeying God. To be in obedience to God. <clears throat> and when, uh, verse 2, And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Well, really, they started out pretty bad. If you remember, they came over, they beat Jericho, they beat Ai, and then they were there, and somebody came over and faked them out because they never asked the Lord what to do. And they actually ended up in a covenant with a Gentile nation, with a heathen nation nation that didn't believe in their God, that God had told them to utterly destroy. But because they did it, God honored that, didn't he? And when they got in trouble, they went and fought. Israel fought for them, and God was leading the way, wasn't he? So he says, make no covenant with them, no show mercy to them. Verse 3, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. Isn't that what we just read? That they did it? They lived with them. Instead of destroying them, they lived with them. They dwelt with them. And now, what happens? Now they're getting married. Their sons are marrying their daughters. Their daughters are marrying their sons. 
And it's sad. Verse 4, and this is why God told them not to do it. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And it's exactly what they did. This nation was, you know, we're in, uh, in uh, Matthew, and we saw that, uh, you know, this past uh, Sunday uh, that Jesus cast out that legion, about 6,825 or 26 uh, demons were cast out into a bunch of pigs, right? Um, well, um, that was the norm at that time. They were so involved in devil worship. The nation of Israel was so involved with devil worship. So Josephus said, the, the Jewish historian, that, that they were the worst, the, that area was the worst in all the nations. How sad. How sad. But this is what will happen, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. So he's warning them right here, look, don't do this. Uh, verse 5, but thus you shall deal with them, you shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. So when they got there, this was something that they had to do, was burn these groves down, burn these wooden images, destroy the, uh, the stone images that they had because they would start following them. Now, it's interesting, as we continue to go uh, through Judges, we're going to see everywhere you turn, there's going to be monuments to other gods. But he says you'll turn away, and he wants them to destroy their altars, their pillars, cut down their woman, wooden images, destroy the carved images. You know, those are, your, those are the gods that you have that you carry around, Right? You know, the ones you put on your dashboard, you know, and they're looking at you. They don't know what's going on, do they? No, because the accident's going to happen in front of you. They should be looking out for you, not at you, right? But we, we do things like that. We have these idols in our life. And we have these things that are more important than God. And this is, this is what happens this is what, and this, if, if, if we've said this before in Romans and in 1 Corinthians, it says these things that happen are for what? For our benefit. Why? To teach us what not to do. And we go back to the most simplest thing. You tell your kids, don't put your hand on the stove, it's hot. What do they do? They put their hand on the stove because that's how we are, isn't it? All they have to do is hear don't, and that means do. We should, you know, it's like how many times in the scripture when Jesus says, you know, don't go, in, don't tell anybody, just go home. You know, don't, don't tell anybody else. Maybe just go tell the priest and nobody else. And what do they do? They tell everybody. And then he tells them, go tell. And what do they do? Nothing. They don't tell anybody because that's how we are. Jesus says, go. We sit on our hands, right? Oh, yeah, I'll think about this. Let me do this tomorrow. Verse 5, but this you shall deal with them, you shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were at least all people. So he didn't choose them for that purpose. He chose them because he loved them, and he wanted to make them his children. And so he tells them, look, when you go into the land, this is what's going to be the temptation and if you fall into this temptation, this is what's going to happen. 
But you know, you could turn back to Judges chapter 3. But you know, God tells us this. just like he tells us today, doesn't he? But we live by grace, don't we? Unmerited favor. But see, in a sense, Israel did as well because all they had to do was turn away. And this is what we're going to see in the book of Judges because you're going to see this cycle of evil, of disobedience. They're going to be disobedient. They're going to do evil things. They're going to forget the Lord. And then they're going to be occupied. And the enemies, the enemy nations are going to come in and uh, make them slaves again. And then they're going to, after a period of time, and it's going to be interesting as we go through this, you're going to see, and you're just going to shake your head and you're going to think, wow, you know, I'd be doing it. You know, it's kind of like Jonah, okay? For me, if some whale would have came and swallowed me and I just passed over his teeth and just get tossed around on his tongue and swallowed and I'm going down the tube into the, his stomach, I'm going to be screaming out to the Lord. I don't have to wait three days. In fact, I'm probably going to be screaming when I see the whale. Lord, help me. Right? But Jonah, he was pretty stubborn, wasn't he? Ah, I'm going to wait three days. Okay, fine. I can imagine I'm sitting there, the stench, seaweed wrapped around him, probably wasn't able to move very much. I don't know. But I'm sure going to do it way before the three days. Well, you're going to see here in this uh, next section that we're going to look at, uh, it takes him eight years. Eight years. So, anyway, uh, verse 7. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord, their God, and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Now, it's, they didn't totally forget about God. They just set him aside. That's what that word means, is to set aside. So it's, like, it's kind of like, uh, you know, well, you know, if I tell this lie, I could get promoted. It's just, it's not hurting anybody, but it is helping me, and God wants me to be happy, right? Where do we get that from? So I'm just going to tell this little white lie, and it'll be okay. So we kind of set aside God and what he said, and we do what we want to do, right? And this is what, this is what Israel did. They forgot. They set aside the Lord, their God, and served other gods. Oh, man. What is wrong with them? What is wrong with them? So they <clears throat> set him aside. Therefore, verse 8, therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rizatham. Ooh, what a name. Could you imagine naming your kid? Hey, let's name him Bart. Nah, 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 nah. Well, let's name him Jim. No, 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 no. Let's name him Kushan Rizatham. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, let's name him that. <laughs> so they, he sold them into the hand of Kushnan Rizatham, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Kushan Rizatham eight years. Now, it's interesting because this name, this Kushan Rizatham, uh, you know what it means? Double wickedness. Or double evil. Let's name our kid double evil. That sounds good. Or double wickedness for, for long. You know, double, double evil for short and double wickedness will be his name. How many in here would do that? Come on. You'd just name him Bart, wouldn't you? <clears throat> so here they are. They served this guy for eight years. You'd think they would have figured it out way before then. But they didn't. 
Verse 9, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. So here they are, they forgot the Lord, they committed evil, they serve in other gods, but then they cry out to the Lord, and what does the Lord do? No, I'm not helping you, you guys suffer. I told you this was going to happen. No, he has mercy on them. His mercies are new every morning. He has grace on them. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to saving grace. So what does he do? He raises up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. So now we've seen this guy, remember? We talked about them before, and we talked about them last week, and I mentioned them already this evening. So this is Othniel. And he was... K- and now, now i got to tell you this before this thing even starts. Uh, Othniel, according to Josephus, the historian, said that he was, you ready? 91 years old when this event happened. 91. So if you sit here today and you're 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 or even 91, you have no excuse. The Lord can still use you. Don't take a back seat to anybody. Don't put it on cruise control. I hear, I, and, and this kind of drives me nuts, I hear, I hear pastors all the time say, oh, I'm going to retire. Huh? What are we here for? Serve the Lord. Where's the retirement plan in that? You got to wait till you get to heaven. When you're done, then you get to go, right? So this guy, Othniel, son-in-law, the son-in-law of uh, Caleb, his name means, do you remember from last week? The Lion of God. Now, I... I'll take the name Othniel, even though it sounds kind of funny, because I like that Lion of God, rather than that uh, Kushan Riznith. Um, I can't even say it anymore. So, uh, and be named Double Wickedness. Hey, here comes Double Wickedness. I'd rather have him say, Hey, here comes Lion of God. Right? Verse ten: The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rizathim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cush, Cushan Rizathim. So, who delivered? God. God did. God did. That, and that's all Israel had to do. Easy, isn't it? Come on, what's the matter with them? You know, it makes you just want to go over there and slap them across the face a couple of times say, what's the matter with you? Look at all that God has done. But see, then we do the same things too. We walk out the door in the mornings thinking about work and forgetting to pray. We walk out the door in the mornings forgetting what we need to do instead of what we think we should do. So we run around chasing our tails, thinking, oh, yeah, it'll be okay, right? But we forget. We forget. So, verse 11, so the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. So eight years they were in bondage. They cried out to the Lord, Sent them a deliverer. He saved them. Sent them a judge so that he could rule over the land. And they had rest for 40 years. But wait, there's more. Verse 12, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. Now, didn't they defeat this guy already? Not him, but they defeated this nation, didn't they? Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, it's kind of interesting because Moab is a descendant of Lot. 
Okay, uh, he this Moab was the incestual relationship with the oldest daughter, and this is where you get Moab. And the other one is Ammon. That's the younger daughter. Um, but every time you look at anything from Moab, they're always negative towards Israel, except one. Can any of you ladies tell me who that is? Who? Was that a guy that said that or a woman? It was Ruth. It was Ruth but I said, women, you don't look like a lady. Come on. Just sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So, except Ruth. She was the only one that it was really in a positive light. Um, verse 13. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. Now, the city of Palms is Jericho. Didn't they already... Beat up on that city, kicked everybody out, destroyed Jericho. Well, obviously, they must have rebuilt it for themselves. Israel did. And now they got defeated by somebody that they had already beaten. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Come on, guys. 18 years. How does it take you that long? Well, you know what? I could say that and I could laugh at them, but you know what? It, it, it took 27 years for me to come to the Lord. So I guess I can't say that, right? But I can because that's there for me to laugh at them about and say, hey, come on, guys. No, but it's there for us to learn, isn't it? So for 18 years, they served. They served. They were in bondage. They were slaves. Verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, and from them Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man, by him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. So this guy, obviously, it was probably pretty rare, and this is how God uh, describes him as a left-handed man. So he was left-handed. Um, so he was the one that the Lord has raised up to fight the king of Moab, to deliver the nation of Israel after 18 years of bondage. So this is the same cycle, isn't it? They do evil. Then what happens? They end up serving, being a slave, then they cry out to the Lord. The Lord hears them, sends them a deliverer, and then gives them rest. You'd think they'd learn. But you know what? Because it, it, if you go through the marriage courses here, it's the same thing when we, you know, when we fight with our spouses, we fight with them, and then you know, we, we don't agree with them, and then, and then we cry out to the Lord, and he, he changes our hearts, and then we, we love each other, and everything's great, and then it starts all over again, and it's just this vicious cycle of, you know, well, you did this to me. Well, no, you did that to me. No, you did this to me way back in 1814. Well, you did this to me back when Washington was crossing the Delaware. Don't you remember? You know, that type of thing. It's like, come on, get over it. Let's move on. And it, but you know what? I can say that and laugh, but it's difficult to do, isn't it? Anybody of us that's married, sometimes we have our days, don't we? You know, who's, who's going to deliver us from this body of flesh? You know, so anyway, um, <clears throat> so he's a Benjamite and he's left handed. It says, Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double edged and a cubit in length. So it was 18 inches. Remember, cubits from your elbow to the tip of your finger, about 18 inches, unless you're short like me with short arms and it's 16 and a half. So. Um, but it's, it, it's 18 inches. He built himself a dagger. It was a double-edged, uh, very large knife. And fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he put it here in his right thigh so that he could grab it this way if he needed to. Well, he's going to need to. 
So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man, so he must have been pretty huge because uh, God said he was a very fat man, so he must have been. Um, and when he had finished presenting the tribute, so what he was doing was uh, they, Israel, being that they were in bondage, had to give this, uh, this king of this nation, Eglon, uh, probably money, crops, everything. Um, and when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute but he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king, he said. Keep silence, and all who attend him went out of the room. So what happened? So they were leaving to go back. They come to the stone images. Now, the stone images were idols. Where were they at? They were in Gilgal. Sound familiar? When they, crossed, when they crossed over the Jordan, they stopped in what? Gilgal. They built a monument to God. They built him one out in the, the middle of the Jordan, and they built one on the dry land. They took the stones off the dry land, and they put the stones in the, in the Jordan River, and they took stones from the Jordan River and built them on the dry land at Gilgal. They got there when? Do you remember? On the 10th of the month. Palm Sunday. Remember? Because a few days... And then what did they do next? Circumcised all the men. Right? This is what they did when they got to Gilgal. They get there. They get circumcised. Three days later, the Passover. The first time they had done the Passover since being in front of Mount Sinai. And they really did pass over, didn't they? They passed over the Jordan on dry land. This is the place, Gilgal. Now it's become a place of idols. So he gets to this place of idols. And he turns back and he goes to the king. Hey, look, king, I got a secret message for you from God. Secret message. Let everybody leave the room. So they all left. Verse 20, so Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Now most of the time the coolest place was on the roof because that was like a different part of the house. And even you go to Israel today, all the roofs are flat. They have parties up there. That's what usually where they sit. It's usually cooler in there because they... Well, most of them have air conditioning now, but when they didn't have it, that was the place to go, and they would, it would be covered, and uh, you would sit underneath there, and that was a cool place. So he, he, he came to him, and, he said, and they were sitting upstairs in the cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right hand, thigh and thrust it into his belly. Now it's going to get pretty gory from here. Even the hilt or the handle of this 18 inch blade, so he must have been a pretty big guy. Uh, even the hilt went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly and his entrails came out. So he jabbed this thing in so far, even the handle went in. <laughs> and then the, when he pulled his hand away, the fat covered it up so he couldn't get the knife out. Hey, I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. So <laughs> It was grossing me out when I was, pretty, when I was reading it, but now I'm good with it. So. <clears throat> but uh, his entrails came out. It was buried in there so far. Uh, then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited till they, they were embarrassed and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room therefore they took the key and opened them and there he 
there was their master fallen dead on the floor. I would imagine so. Especially if his entrails come out, he was pretty much done. But uh, <clears throat> here Ehud went in and slew Eglon. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sarah. And it happened when, the, when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains and he led them. So here is their deliverer. He destroyed their enemy. Well, at least the, the main guy of their enemy the deliverer that God had sent, the deliverer that, uh, because God had mercy on Israel. Then he said to them, follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords, they left all the Chevys, they left the Toyotas, they left everything, but they seized all the fords, especially the pickups, <laughs> of the Jordan leading to Moab and did not follow, did not allow anyone to cross over. So a ford is a pass. Now, not a forward pass, but a place where you could travel along. So where they could cross over, whether it be a river or something like that, uh, you know, maybe an area, but they, uh, they, um, they did not allow them. They took over these areas, these fords. Now, see, you can't do that with a Chevy because, you know, it, it's just not built right. So I'm sorry, everybody who has a Chevy or a Toyota or whatever. But anyway, hey, I'm just, I'm just saying Fords, you know. So. And at that time, they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. You know... It's difficult to be obedient sometimes. But you're so far ahead when we are obedient. And the Lord leads us. And the Lord guides us. Because the Lord will provide for you. He'll equip you. Even though we're so ill-equipped, He will always do it. He'll always give you the right words. He'll always give you the right scripture. He is always faithful. Now, I'm not saying sometimes you can't go out there and you can't think of anything, and there might be a reason for that. It, not, might, it might not be time. But the idea is this. Do we follow him? Because we know what happens when we don't. We see it. We've been reading it. We've had two judges now. We're going to do 12 of them, and it's going to be the same thing. They're going to do evil. They're going to be put in bondage. They're going to cry out to the Lord. The Lord's going to send them a deliverer, and they're going to have rest. And then we'll start it all over again. Let's do evil. But see, we as believers, God wants us to live by a different standard, doesn't he? You know, when we were going through Matthew chapter 5 in that first part, and uh, Jesus was telling his disciples all the blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. And then he gets to, you've heard it said. Not that you read it in the scripture, but that you heard it said by a bunch of guys who didn't know what they were talking about. You heard it said. If you so much as hate, if you, if you commit murder, you have broken a commandment. But Jesus said, if you so much as hate, you have committed murder. It says, do not commit adultery. But Jesus said, if you so much as lust in your heart, you have committed adultery. It's all a matter of the heart, isn't it? These people, being that they never saw God, maybe their parents never told them what God did for them. They might not have put two and two together. Maybe they were stubborn, and probably most of them were. Maybe they were prideful. Oh, I don't need God. Look at what we got. Look at the land. 
hey, we're holding these guys under tribute. They're, you know, they're, they're working our land and we're charging them tax money. But see, God's word never fails, does it? And see, unfortunately, that's what the world's going to understand someday. Is that God said, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Thankfully for us, and for really everybody, if you accept it. You know, we're forgiven for those things that we've done. Now, we might have to pay the penalty in the flesh. You go out and kill somebody, you're going to pay the penalty. You go out and commit a crime, you're going to commit a penalty. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna pay for that. You're going to have to pay in the flesh. God will always forgive you. But this nation, they were given the promised land. They were given the land of milk and honey. Everything was prepared for them. And they turned away from the Lord because they weren't obedient. And it got them in trouble. But you know what? Eight years and then 18 years. What is wrong with them? So, and at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So they did good for 80 years after 18 years in bondage. Verse 31. Now this guy is only mentioned twice here and in chapter 5 doesn't really tell a lot about him it says after him was Shamgar the son of Anath who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad and he also delivered Israel that's all we know about him don't have any years, how many years they were in bondage. It didn't say like it did in the other ones that they cried out to the Lord. And the Lord heard them and sent a deliverer. But he killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad. An ox goad um, is a long stick, sometimes up to eight feet long. That's very pointy. And what they would do is if the ox wouldn't you know, do what they told them, they would stick them with it. And then the ox had kicked back. Well, they're eight feet back there, so it really doesn't matter. You kick all day. Your leg's not long enough. But uh, if you remember uh, Paul on the road to Damascus, and Jesus stuck his face in the cloud and said, Hey, Paul, how's it going? Why do you persecute me? Why do you kick against the goads? That's what he was talking about. Why are you, you, know, you can't do anything to me. You could kick your foot back. You could kick your foot forward. But I got that eight-foot stick. Yeah. All right? So that's what this is. Not a lot about this guy other than he was a Gentile. Interesting. God sending a Gentile to deliver Israel. Very interesting. I actually think it's pretty awesome. I, you know, I, as, as we go through this, and we have gone through this, and, and uh, for those of you that, that have been pretty faithful to Wednesday nights, and, and we've seen all these things, haven't we? It's, it's amazing. It's amazing the pictures that we see, that we have seen. The images, like, like last week when we talked about this Othniel and how it was a picture of Christ. He's... Othniel was the lion of God, and he defeated an enemy to take a bride who was adorned. That's us. The adorned bride. But there's so many picture, picture after picture. The sacrifices told the stories. All the stones, all the garb that the, uh, the high priest wore. All the way, the way the tribe would, the nation of Israel would travel across the wilderness. And the way God set them up, and, and each one had a, a number of people on the, on the north and on the uh, east and on the west and on the, on the south. 
And we saw as they, because of the amount of people that they had, as they went and crossed across the desert in the sign of the cross. We saw how when uh, um, the snakes would come in, the serpents would come in and bite. The poisonous serpents would come in and bite Israel. How all they had to do was look to the insignia, which was a cross that Moses had on a pole. And we look at that today. People that don't believe, all they have to do is look to the cross. Their salvation is right there. Right there. But all the pictures that we've seen, and now we, we look at these, at, at the nation of Israel, and, and, and this is going to go on and on until David, their king, comes. But you notice how each time when that judge dies, they just revert back to wickedness. To wickedness. And it's a sad thing because what does that tell us? That they're not passing it on. And it's a lesson for us and a picture for us. Are we telling our kids and our grandchildren? Are we living a life that they could look at us and say, well, you know, I don't believe, but, uh, you know, my parents are pretty faithful or my grandparents are pretty faithful or maybe an aunt or uncle because they believe in God. And when push comes to shove, they're going to come back because they've heard it. They heard of the love of Christ. Are we telling them? Are we just thinking, well, you know, it took me a long time to get saved, so it'll be okay. No, no. Because before we were saved, we were what? We weren't in darkness, we were darkness. Isn't that what Ephesians says? It doesn't say we were in darkness. We were darkness. But now we are light. And we have that light. And that, that light exposes the falsehoods from the enemy doesn't it? It shows the difference. What happens when you flip on the light? All the cockroaches take off, don't they? Well, so do all the evil. So what do we learn as we look at this? And we see these three, we see three out of the 12, so we got nine left. Some of them are in depth, some of them, well, one verse, one Gentile. Killed 600 men with an ox goad. So Bruce Lee had nothing on this guy, did he? He couldn't have taken out 600 guys with a stick. Your uh, Navy SEALs, they couldn't have done that either. But this guy, he was with the Lord. You know, it's like God said, one man is like a thousand who follows the Lord. And we're going to see that in a couple more chapters when we get to Gideon. So it's encouraging for us today. One person. Remember last week we talked about standing up. The Lord was looking for somebody to stand in the gap for his people, and he found none. You remember that in Ezekiel that we read? He's still looking, isn't he? And I know some of you, I know some of you are doing that, but we need to all do that. Because in your sphere of life, are you that one that's standing up? In your circle of people that you know, that you work with, your neighbors, are you that person that's standing up? Or are you taking it for granted, waiting for somebody else to come along? So I want to encourage you. We're all in this together. We all need prayer. We all need to stand in the gap for each other. Now, I know a few weeks back, uh, we talked about how many people were sick in the church, and it's nice to know that most all of them are much better. So hopefully that comes to an end fairly rapidly. Um, 
So, but keep praying. Pray for each other. Pray, f- husbands, pray for your wives and your children. Wives, pray for your husbands and your children. Pray for each other. Grandparents, man, pray for those grandchildren. We, uh, yeah. We need to pray. Amen? So I actually finished eight minutes early. I want you to mark this down. What's the date? The 2nd, February 2nd, 2022. So this is a miracle here. I, I think I've finished early like one or two times, but it was like a minute or something. So now that we're done early, any questions about what we talked about today? Everybody scared to open their mouth, or you have no questions? So it got explained good enough? Hey, that works out good. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because only he could do that. So, Well, let's pray. Would you stand with me and pray? If you need prayer, come on up after the service. There'll be somebody up here to pray with you. Uh, if you need to buy a ticket for Valentine's, it's right out the door at the table. Uh, Lynn will be over there shortly. Um, wow. Hey, I want you to pray for a lady. We've, if you haven't, um, if you have, if you're not on the prayer request uh, line, you should be. Um, you just fill out one of those forms that are over there on that uh, bookcase, and uh, put your email address in there, and, and you can be on it. Uh, but I want you to pray for a lady specifically, uh, and she's close to, um, well, we don't know if it's breakfast with Jesus or if it's not. So pray for her, for her salvation, uh, that the Lord would touch her, maybe heal her if it be his will. Um, and pray for the two knotheads that are going over there tomorrow to talk to her. So, amen. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you can teach us through this and that we can understand by your Holy Spirit. And, uh, Father, we, we ask that uh, we don't have to be like Israel, but we could be like you s- designed it to be, that we could learn from them, Lord, instead of having to go through it and suffer through it. But we know one thing, Lord, that you love us, that your grace abounds in our life, that it never fails, that you have mercy upon mercy upon mercy for us. You you long suffer over us daily, Lord. And Lord, I'd like to lift up all our family members here for each one of us. And as I'm speaking, hopefully, Lord, you remind each and every one of us of who they are that need a touch from you, Lord, that needs salvation. And Lord, we just ask that whatever it takes, whatever it takes, Lord, that they can come to the saving knowledge of your great love, of your grace. Father, we love you. We praise you. Father, I ask that you you put your hand upon everyone here, Lord, that you fill them with your Holy Spirit, that they can go out and boldly proclaim your word. Father, I ask that you baptize each one of us afresh. Give us a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit that we may speak in boldness, that the doors may be open and that we may see them open and walk through them. Father, we love you and we praise you and we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his children said...